I think Sebastian and I would really get along. Uh, our two um, speeches today are entirely uncoordinated, but I think we're going to be able to drive the point home for you. Growing up, I was fascinated with construction, building things and transportation. I had books about trains and cars and airplanes and ships and bulldozers. I could spend hours and hours with any sort of building thing that was in front of me. Building blocks, bristle blocks, Lincoln logs, erector sets, tinker toys, and Legos. So many hours with Legos. On occasion, the family driveway was turned into an elaborate urban planning test bed with matchbox and Hot Wheels cars traveling along newly created subdivisions through the magic of just colored chalk and upside down boxes and strawberry cartons and things. My eventual career choice could certainly easily be traced back to the time I was spending in the yard or uh, in the den, you know, playing with, with all of uh, the different construction toys. Well, fast forward a bit. One college summer, I was working for the Maryland State Highway Administration on a project just a few miles from my home in Maryland. It was a reconstruction of US 50 and 301 and Maryland 197. It would become a very long summer day. One of the inspectors was on vacation, and the plan was to set pedestrian bridge beams at 4 a.m. I was, I was new. Uh, I didn't need to be there for that, but I was interested in seeing it. You know, so up before the crack of dawn, I went out there, and it was indeed somewhat more interesting than collecting tickets from asphalt delivery drivers. Uh, but maybe not that exciting. Uh, I still did the rest of the day's work, checking on guardrail and seating and the asphalt paving, electrical work. And so I was filling out paperwork into the evening. It was around eight o'clock and then a big thunderstorm blew through, rain, wind, lightning, and then a knock at the door. And it was like, well, who on earth would that be? Well, it was the state patrol. And uh, gentleman said, you're going to want to clean up your barrels. Uh, I was thinking, my barrels? Uh, your traffic control on, on 50 was impacted by the storm that just blew through. And before I could say much of anything else, he was back, headed back to his car. So I probably stammered something like, thank you, officer. Um, and by now, of course, it was late. And across the whole of the construction site, it was just me. Everybody sensible had left prior to the storm, especially those people that were setting bridge beams at four in the morning. Um, <clears throat> I don't recall, I expect, like, what I really thought then. I was kind of like, well, you know, what do I do? And it turned out this was a, a day before cell phones, right? There were emergency contact numbers on the back of the shack door, uh, at least five of them or more. And I'm sure in the training manual, it's like, well, if anything happens or you need assistance, call one of these numbers. And so, all right, I did. So there were five or six numbers. Uh, it's coming up on 9 p.m. How many people think uh, in 1986 I got through to? Yep, you're right. Zero. Um, I left callback numbers and messages on answering services, and I, I have no idea. Like, hi there. I have no idea who you are because that's not on this board. Um, but your number's listed on the back of a door of a state highway construction shack, and the state patrol reports we have attenuator barrels scattered across the freeway. Uh, can you help with that immediately? Um, it's 904. My phone number is 301. Seven more numbers. Oh, yeah, this is Derek. I'm the new engineering intern. I started two weeks ago. Uh, call me back. Um, I had no idea what our construction manager's home phone number was or my supervisor Phil's number. Uh, so it's 915 and I'm still in the office. Like, I wonder how bad it is. I mean, the project's miles long. Uh, there are open pavement gaps in one lane and, and I hadn't been out on main line. So it was like, okay, I, I do have keys to the van and it's pretty noticeable when you put the revolving beacons on. So I guess they are my barrels. Um, so I grab my PPE and the keys and away I go. And I spend probably the next half hour, 45 minutes, pitch black main line, not a lot of traffic, thankfully, uh, resetting maybe a few dozen barrels or so uh, and running headlong with the highway van uh, into a barricade that had flipped over and knocking out a headlight and thinking about all the paperwork. Um, so at least one incident uh, was a result, uh, and that was me. <laughs> and uh, but I felt responsible, and I felt a pride in you know potentially keeping you know motorists safe. And kind of like that stormy night in the construction trailer, I found that my public sector jobs and and really my career in public service, most of which uh, was with Minnesota DOT, I found it exceptionally rewarding. I enjoy solving problems. It's a privilege to have been solving problems at the state and now the federal level. Transportation connects people to places and provides connection to recreation, family, friends, goods to market. And we all benefit from that. Infrastructure, water, wastewater, power, uh, transit by uh, land, sea, air, and, and space. 
Uh, and beyond transportation just itself, you know, the geoengineering community serves as a valuable resource for people combating uh, and uh, coastal resilience and, and working towards sustainability, providing opportunity uh, and preparation for climate change. So many of the designers and contractors that I work with take such pride in their work, and it's great to have been involved as we collectively, um, you know, look back at our achievements when projects are complete. As I work with organizations like DFI and TRB and ASCE, uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, it really has, you know, as others find their paths to, to explore and contribute new and different ideas. As you can tell from the award lectures at this event, IFC 2021, there's a wealth of experience collected and shared here within our community. But did you notice that almost every talk indicated there's more to do, more to be understood and more to be invented? The challenges aren't over. There's still pretty of plenty of room for your contributions and mine uh, wherever we are in our careers. And in case you hadn't picked up on it, I have a bias toward public work and works. Um, if you're just starting your career or if you've been engaged for years, I would encourage you to become involved and it will benefit either you know, your local neighborhood or perhaps projects across the planet. We live in an exciting time of connection and potential and possibilities. Uh, we can repair and rebuild today's infrastructure and confront challenges uh, with both tried and true methods and new and novel and unexpected approaches. Maybe what inspires me most is that built works are iconic and defining. I think of through history, you know, Stonehenge, the Parthenon, Anasazi cliff dwellings, the Mayan pyramids, the terraces of Machu Picchu, Colosseum and the Great Wall. Then and now certainly we can also think of, you know, music and clothing and wildlife, but I often think of places, you know, in terms of, of what we've built, the Sydney Opera House, the White House, the Space Needle. Big Ben, the Taj Mahal, the Blue Mosque, and St. Basil's Cathedral, places that you automatically associate with where they are. You know, if I show you a painting or something like that, you can think, ah, you know, Paris, the Eiffel Tower. And you have to imagine that many of these works were made by collections of individuals that embraced the notion that we had at ASCE, right? Dream big. And not to knock our peers in other disciplines, but when was the last time you bought a postcard? For those of you that may have bought a postcard anytime recently at a souvenir shop, you know, that was featuring a sludge digester or a Gantt chart or a smartphone or a washing machine. No, it's a picture of the St. Louis Arch or the Air and Space Museum or the London Eye or maybe here in Minnesota, the world's largest ball of twine. Geotechnical engineering is so cool. There are even postcards about places that are famous for things gone wrong. Perhaps some of you have heard about structural retrofits of a small bell tower on soft soils in Italy. Yeah, postcards about that. So, you know, isn't that neat? You may have figured out by now that I enjoy and have a passion for what I do. Speakers on the topic of motivation often mention it comes from things that capture our interest, things uh, that we do them because they matter or because they're interesting or important. I think structures are pretty important. As it turns out, we as a species build a lot of stuff on the ground. Uh, mind you, a well-executed treehouse is pretty cool too. Uh, but what motivates me is that I found geoengineering in particular to be exciting and mysterious, artistic and playful, abstract and concrete, simple and complex, old and new, friend and foe, and always, always different and full of constant potential of the unexpected. It's never the same day twice. Frequently, solutions are a work in progress, changing, adapting, evolving uh, to meet whatever the project need is. And if you want more of a challenge, just add water. Concrete and steel, they're so predictable. ASTM 36, Young's Modulus 200 GPA, Poisson's Ratio, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all in textbooks, right? Geoengineering is a field of vibrant diversity. The earth is a wondrous collection of rock and mineral bedded and deposited and worked and reworked by forces of nature from the softest clays to the hardest rocks. Variations of color, size, angularity, mineralogy, all these different things. And technologies inspired by worms and mounted on satellites hurting, hurtling through space help us out. Consider the number of in situ tools we have to poke and prod and twist and nudge our geomaterials and an array of lab tests that are equally as broad and diverse. Uh, uncompression testing, bender elements, inspired physical modelers have even developed transparent sand where you have quartz immersed in blended materials that match the refraction indices. Now, how cool is that? And above the ground, we have readily available data sets that we can mine for information and use as with technologies like INSAR and LIDAR. And below the ground, geophysics, magnetics, gravity, resistivity, seismic, GPR. 
the array of construction equipment we have to install different piles and shafts and nails and anchors and bolts and tendons and reinforcements and pinning and all sorts of other names that you could uh, draw out of a hat, right? As an example of just materials themselves, look at lightweight fill, wood chips, tire-derived agria, polyurethane, cellular foamed concrete, foamed glass, expanded shale, polystyrene foam, I, you know, to name a few, and the people. We have made friends in other disciplines. One you'd think, uh, ones you'd think of certainly hydraulics, design, construction, geology, earth science, but new friends in computer science, data analytics, virtual reality, visualization, GIS, computer simulation, drones, game design, smart structures, 3D printing, bio-inspired, and nanotechnology. The variety is also in our workforce of today and tomorrow, specialty jobs in a population of enormously talented people. And representation matters. It is so great to be part of a community that respects and encourages underrepresented groups to participate and contribute. I've worked in groups of women and men from various countries, ethnic backgrounds, communities, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, levels of education, fields of study, young and admittedly somewhat less young, uh, tall and short, wide and thin. It's an amazing diversity. So the title I was planning to discuss with you today, Geotechnical Risk and the Idea of Rock, Paper, Ceremonial Scissors, well, it took a twist the way things uh, geotechnically sometimes do. I was going to talk about how uh, you can relate geotechnics to things like game theory and skills and possibilities and choices. But the metaphor is still appropriate. Hopefully everybody's familiar with those big ceremonial scissors, the ones that they use, you know, the oversized dignitary comes up and six people hold on to them as they cut a, you know, a ribbon. Well, in the real game of rock, paper, scissors, people use their hands, they create one of three forms. It's a zero-sum competitive game. Well, I'm much more a fan of cooperative games where players collaborate and have the opportunity to win together. So in my version of rock, paper, ceremonial scissors, the ceremonial scissors represent the time, talent, and tools for public projects. The rock represents the site and the paper, the plans that you use. And the nice thing is the ceremonial scissors always win. So maybe on reflection, I guess my variation of the game perhaps lacks excitement or unpredictability that I've just noticed makes our profession so exciting and strong. And maybe that's why I'm not a game designer. So note to self, keep day job. I hope you found this talk to be part of your day that was maybe a little creative or engaging or entertaining or thoughtful, or at least a useful and perhaps appreciated opportunity to check your mobile device for messages. More importantly, I hope that you're able to be creative, enjoy your career, and find your own rewards and experiences of your own rock, paper, ceremonial, scissors projects, and follow your own unique geotechnical path. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you.